Thank you all for coming. Um, brief uh, introduction and background. Kelly Oliver was kind enough to uh, ask me to do this, or invited me to do it. Too. She invited me to do the panel on Chris David and film uh, when she was putting all this together, and I really appreciated it. Um, I had just finished a, a book on. Uh, Clint Eastwood, and uh, one of the readers for the book said it could be called Clint e uh, Chris Davis America rather than Clint Eastwood's America, because I used so much of, uh, of Chris Davis in it, and then Kelly thought, well, it would make sense to talk. And, she's, and she suggested that I talk a little bit how I discovered and how I came on Chris Davis and thought to, uh, to use it uh, in my work. And um, it goes back, uh, one of the thoughts, uh, one of the uh, papers here. Uh, in one of those papers, it was mentioned that Chris Stava was an atheist, a devout, a devoted atheist. And my own sense of Chris Stava is that if she is an atheist, she's an atheist still in search of the sacred. Uh, Sarah Birdsworth and I were talking about that. And uh, like in some ways, that she, re she resembles in, in that search uh, Levinas. And uh, when Levinas talks about the secularization of the sacred, uh, and that was the way I was using the two of them in a kind of search, Kristeva for love, really, and well for love, and, uh, and using instead of this anatology and the uh, pessimism of Freud, trying to use uh, Freud to really realign uh, identity and forces for something more positive than that uh, pessimism. Um, for me, Kristeva, the German, somebody correct me, uh, the Devater Personalism Foresight, the, the, uh, the father of personal prehistory, uh, uh, is also part of that search. So I don't know if that means you know, that she's an atheist or a kind of Levinasian atheist in the concern for the other. And in Eastwood's films, for me, whether it's Unforgiven in the, uh, in the uh, manger, what I call the manger shed scene that uh, Stephanie Hoskins talked about in. Uh, uh, in her work in my class, my undergraduate, or in the bridge for Mystic River, that becomes a kind of transcendent bridge for me, and the aerial shots, or the million dollar baby becomes a uh, story of sacrifice for Eastwood, uh, that I think for Stave and Living Us also inform, and even the refusal to dehumanize both sides in the Iwo Jima saga. So Christaver has been really important for me for that, and that's how I came to use her. I have no idea what Christeva would think. I, uh, I got her address and I mailed her the book and said a prayer in Hebrew and waited to get an answer back and I'm still waiting. Maybe that's how she'll... Uh, I'm sure she just trashed it, but I have no idea I haven't gotten back. Uh, so with having said that, and uh, Phil, what Kelly suggested about how I came upon Christeva, let me introduce my wonderful panel you know, and people I really care about from the left probably politically, too, from the left. Uh, Jennifer, <laughs> she went to Yale, what else would you expect? Uh, from the left, Jennifer Smythe. Uh, I, uh, uh, Jane Dorsey Taylor in my class can vouch for the fact that I now have a Jennifer Smythe, not, not quite a lecture, but a talk when I talk about Jennifer and what, the, the research that she does and how I wish I were doing that. She does this amazing archival research where she really knows what she's talking about with film and puts it in the context of culture and critical analysis. And it's something I wish I had started doing years ago, and she's amazing at it. Uh, Ann Kern, um, and Jennifer teaches at Warwick, not Warwick, where I'm from, but Warwick. Is that right? Close? Close. I can't even speak. Anyway, Ann but Kern. Ann has been a guardian angel for me since I met her in Lyon, and I couldn't get around in anything. And uh, she's at Purchase, New York, and also um, I remember Dudley Andrew at Yale. She was a Dudley Star student and somebody I've been learning from for years and for her work on psychoanalysis and, and game theory and an amazing individual. I, mean, I guess that's pretty good so far. Uh, and I'm still learning from her. Uh, Marinda Simmons, Marinda from deep in the heart of Alabama. Um, her, uh, I know her through her... her uh, her, her brother, J. Aaron Simmons, who uh, was a graduate student here in philosophy and now is getting tenure at a, at a university. And J. Aaron, became, J. Aaron became my tutor in philosophy. Uh, other people in philosophy went off to other places. 
but he was always there. Levinas says the presence of the other is a presence that teaches. And, uh, and he never, sometimes he talked too much, but he was terrific. And in discussing with him, I learned about Miranda and the work with Houston Baker, who is here, and African American Studies. And I'm very excited to hear her work. Kristen Hole, I met at Texas A&M, just like uh, Nancy Warren and at Governor Perry, Texas A&M. We were at a Levinas conference, and they were doing a panel on the night on the book on Levinas that I did, and she was working on uh, the body and, um, and phenomenology uh, from, at, at, at SUNY, SUNY, not Purchase, SUNY. Are you? Stone. Stone. I mean, SUNY Bowman, I'm amazed. So, have I gotten your names confused yet? Uh, <laughs> Stony Brook. And uh, I thought it would be wonderful to find a, a grad, to have a graduate student who's almost finished with her work uh, here for that. And Stephanie Page Hoskins, who changes her name every few weeks from, <laughs> so I never know who we're talking about, <laughs> is a senior at Vanderbilt. And um, we have this Little John uh, Fellowship. Uh, so she's a Little John Fellow and, uh, and finishing her degree and getting ready to go on to graduate school. I quote her in my Eastwood book about with uh, the manger scene, and she's a mixed story. And we've been working on Shakespeare and film uh, in this Little John project, and it's like an ambition of mine for 50 years, and finally I felt I knew enough about film to actually try to use Shakespeare with it, and she's been fantastic for that. So that's who everyone is. Why don't we just start with uh, uh, Jennifer. Thank you. I'm afraid given the size of this panel, there may be no questions. So <laughs> my apologies, and I am going to go with I think there may be a little bit of time after that. We yeah, well, lots. don't hold your breath. So, <laughs> this um, may also be sort of subtitled Resisted Women in Contested Frames. Um, I'm not quite sure whether the title character was um, sort of had some kind of allusion to the real Julia Kristeva or to a conglomeration of, of women, among them Muriel Gardner, but some of this might actually come out in the talk. So in 1977, as you know, Kristeva posited that second phase women seek a language for their corporeal and intersubjective experiences which have been silenced by cultures of the past, and that feminism is returning to an archaic or mythic memory as well as to the cyclical or monumental temporality of marginal movements. So her work on language and meaning, the symbolic and the semiotic, are shadowed by contemporaneous concerns of postmodernist feminist historiography and writers like Schoenberger Gluck, who demanded in the same year a new form for the new content of women's lives and experience, or in other words, a historical discourse to counter the symbolic masculine meta-historical discourse in chronology and history. So the grand meta-narrative, like the symbolic, was challenged and splintered at this time by individual experience, a decentered emphasis on cultural history, a refusal of canonicity, something I don't think her state has really come to terms with entirely in her own work, while clinging to the reassuring symbolic order of historical objectivity. So the question for many was whether in putting emphasis on beats and rhythms that normally had no historiographic attention, were women's historians and postmodernists merely tethering women's history to a regenerated symbolic order? All this is probably familiar to many of you. So while classic or studio era Hollywood had long paid tribute to narratives written by and about and screened by women, its histories were also dismissed as debased, fictive, shock girl fantasies by mostly male cultural critics invested in templates of real masculine achievement and national public spectacles. So feminist film critics found few things to salvage from the studio era and by and large consigned Hollywood's women's films made in the dead zone between first and second stage feminism, roughly 1920 to 1960, to the ideological scrap heap. So Julia, adapted from the memoirs of screenwriter Lillian Heldman about her ambiguous relationship with an anti-fascist activist and psychoanalyst in the 1930s, sometimes identified as Muriel Gardner, but actually a conglomeration of Mary Madeleine Foucault and Virginia Hall, who worked for the CIA during the Second World War, was the definitive feature film to address the concept of the cyclical, the monumental, and the feminine elements of memory's rejection of chronology and the totality of meaning. And for those of you who have seen this film, you will realize that it is jumping just about everywhere. And there, there's a really outstanding and unusual style of work in this film that offended many critics. And I'm going to hopefully have some time to unpack individual elements of this, this potential language. And it does so not merely by anticipating and tapping into many of the theoretical realignments in women's history and postmodernism, but by a return to the fictional women's histories created in the so-called classical era of filmmaking. So interestingly, most critics tend to see Julia as merely an articulation of Hellman's notorious lies and exaggerations about her own past. 
at best another one of the legions of Hollywood women's fictions for the screen. So I want to suggest three things in this talk. That to paraphrase Virginia Woolf, women can have a historiography of their own, and it is a combination of visual and verbal screen discourses that the filmmakers self-consciously invoke and inscribe in the productive discourses about their own films. And that it's, um, it's this kind of discourse found one of its most coherent, even though ambiguous articulations in Julia, and that its historical revolt against history emerged within the world of women's fiction and debased, archaic, feminized Hollywood culture of the 1930s, rather than from the widespread symbolic revolts of the 1960s and 70s. So I'm returning with all irony to the archaic and monumental of classical Hollywood to locate a resistant women's historiography. So it's been argued that historical film at best provides a kind of counter discourse in the past, and that invention is key in the formulation of this genre. So what does that look like on film? And what's the process of its production? So I'm not sure whether I would argue that historical film is the semiotic of historiography, but Julia itself has an unusual, non-chronological historical structure involving a complex array of sound bridges, texts, documents, dissolved superimpositions, and ambiguous voiceovers, and sound distortions. Now, some elements are linguistic historical formulations and corrections. Um, others are less easy to tabulate, more amorphous, partial, resistant to narrativizing. Um, the individual elements of Julia's style, to a certain extent, they have precedence to, in a, to a greater or lesser degree in different um, cinematic traditions and within Hollywood itself. But in blending the content and form in this film, I think they are extraordinary and offer something for women's historiography. So, in a corner of one of his pages of production notes on Julia, <coughs> Fred Zinnemann wrote, I am in a totally false position, and I'll give somebody a prize if they can find it on this page. Uh, it's part of a tapestry for sketches, camera setups, script jottings, commentary, and phone numbers, written in several varieties of, hand, of his handwriting. And you'll notice that Tom Stoppard is up there as well, too. Um, it's very difficult to see this. There are thousands of production notes on this film by various people. But this note is important because it's about the film's original author and protagonist, Lillian Hellman, and her alleged invention of her historical script. Now, perhaps these refusals of historicism are unimportant, but in Julia's case, I think it's particularly important to recognize the consequences of Hellman's imagination, because her memoir, and especially the film, memorialize a great woman, a resistance leader, and do so through the legitimization of oral history, a mode crucial to much of women's historiography and certainly to that of the resistance, or during the war, being on paper meant that you were likely to die. Yet, Zinnemann's discomfort with Hellman's ambiguities enabled him to explore the very real struggle for historical legitimacy plaguing Hollywood cinema, and more particularly, women's history in film. So throughout his career, he put women back into historical narratives where normally you wouldn't expect them. You will know from High Noon that Gary Cooper only survives because his wife shoots a bad guy in the back. And you will know if you are familiar with, for example, these are some of the precedents for Julia. From Here to Eternity, where a film arguably about the onset of the Second World War actually closes on two women mythologizing and inscribing a certain kind of historical rationale to the past. Um, and it focuses very much on their lives as well as on the military. Um, both were based on works of historical fiction, and traditionally it's through this mode that 20th century novelists and screenwriters have recuperated women's presence on screen through history. But while writer Alvin Sargent and Zinnemann's historical toolkit made use of stylistic elements which are drawn from studio-era Hollywood's classical Hollywood genre, the renewed interest in women's history, women in the resistance, and postmodern theory were doing something perhaps quite different here, amplifying the content. So Hellman's credibility isn't really the issue here. Um, rather, an analysis of the film's edited rhythms, conflicting voices, stage memories, and engaged rejection of spectacle form a semiotic, I think, which is deliberately at odds with mainstream historical narration. Um, I may be able to show a clip, but perhaps not in the interests of time. So I'm, I'm struggling with seeing these elements as manifestations of the semiotic, or even in their refusal of historical and linguistic structure, possibly Cora, something that Shoholm and Chris David have located outside the symbolic, but what historical-based critics like Butler have termed the, really the least useful of all of her formulations in her work. So here's the paradox. The three women who were actually involved in constructing this film um, saw things differently. Um, and in interviews and letters, they show that they wanted a more traditional, albeit subaltern, history biography buttressed with conventional details. So Fonda claims she responded to her role in this film more than any other because of the truth 
inherent in the film. And you'll notice based on a true story, you see it everywhere in our sort of new Hollywood's historical term, which is ironically not about women now, um, although during the classic era, arguably, it was. Now, she said it represented the lives of thinking women, and after playing a succession of limited romantic roles and, fe and female dependents, um, on men being the sort of the uppermost concern of the films. Fonda said, I don't want to do films that are dishonest anymore. So Sargent and Zinneman's script annoyed Lillian Hellman, who was one of the consultants on the film, because the production paid too little attention to old-fashioned historical details. She wrote to Zinneman, there are times when I had trouble understanding what period it was and why, but okay, if it seems clear to other people who have not read the story, but this is not a work of fiction, and certain laws have to be followed for that reason. And Redgrave argued, she was very famous for passing out Marxist literature when she was on location <laughs> in, in um, Great Britain, I would think that Julia was a member of the Communist Party, but in our script you wouldn't see it. Insofar as you can tell from the material, Julia was a serious political fighter, but we don't know what she was doing, and I think there's more to the story. And of course, many of you will know that the after story when she wins her Academy Award, where Paddy Chayefsky um, notoriously silences her and basically tells her to shut up the Academy Awards when she talks about Israeli gangsters, which are, um, you know, working against the Palestinians. And she actually worked with, uh, um, lived with a Palestinian family at, in Paris when she was making this film. So there is this kind of unruly discourse that Zinnemann was hesitant to manage, but it was also part of a kind of positivist, historical, very traditional attitude toward history um, in terms of the film's overall um, narrative logic. So some film critics would agree with Hellman and Redgrave, really wishing that there had been more historical details. And these are some of the potential um, connections with Julia as well, too. It wasn't the first film, indeed, to talk about women in the resistance or women with guns. And here she is, just after making her speech. Um, people really wanted to see more of the two of them together. This is a film that didn't rely on any kind of conventional heterosexual pairings. They wanted to look at her influence. They, and um, this is one of the more interesting films in that there was enormous an enormous um, audience campaign as well, too, that focused on women's responses to this film. And they actually had hour-long interviews where Zinnemann and Richard Roth and other members of the production team were talking with women in the New Haven area, so arguably they may have had a, um, more access to certain kinds of education. and. Um, and in Toronto as well, too, looking at this film and really um, sort of exhausting its possibilities for transforming Hollywood. But arguably, the emphasis here in this film was more on a new form than a new content. And it's unhelpful that I'm not able to show you the clip quite yet, but maybe we'll be getting there. Um, in the opening prologue narrated by Jane Fonda, um, you remember she quotes Pentimento, where she says um, that remembering is a way of looking at a picture that has changed, an old picture where meanings transform, and you see something, and again, you re-see. Um, Julia's life is, like many resistance women, though, it operates in the shadows, away from the dangers of traditional documentation and the ensuing myths of lawless resistance historiography. And to a certain extent, you want to see Julia, but the point is that you can't, um, for very obvious reasons. Lillian Hellman is the hollow celebrity that you do see that is documented. She is the well-known woman, the writer, the embodiment of historical distortion, though. Julia, the other side of the great woman, the fictive woman, potentially, is not known to contemporary history or only imperfectly. She's not in historical records. She's in a kind of amorphous memory. She's one of an army of shadows. As Alliance Chief Mary Madeleine Foucault once put it, the army who shifted and succeeded one another and changed places like images in a film fading and being replaced by others to ensure continuity. So Hellman's memories of Oxford um, with Julia accentuate the latter's connection to the past. And here you actually see some of the more ambiguous words um, that Zinnemann was thinking about when he was dealing with this particular film. He says, not slick, not manicured, not polished. Or he's actually telling Dougie Slocum that he wants a kind of nostalgic haze in the cinematography. This is something that I hope I'll be able to come back to later. Um, the director chose to um, shoot Redgrave in a series of archways, and these are sort of the ways he's sort of framing it. Um, very often, we sort of wonder just how films mean what they mean and how filmmakers are thinking, but for Zinnemann, he was really remarkable at actually talking about why certain setups meant things to him. So here we see Vanessa Redgrave um, as she's sort of approaching in this moment, Julia is sort of being remembered. Um, and it was a moment that many of his co-workers uh, didn't really like in the film. She sort of walks closer and closer to a waiting camera, and it remains stationary even when Redgrave actually seems to, uh, her eyes seem to swallow up the frame. Now, Walter Murch and even um, Jane Fonda found this style very excessive and they said, cut it, it doesn't fit within this, there's too much. It's, it's, um, 
it unbalances the film. And he really refused, and he said that the camera was replicating he Hellman's perspective, and it is Lillian who remembers Julie as being perfect. So the narration, to a certain extent, has a, an ironic staging. Um, the face is seen, for example, in the cinematography through a nostalgic haze. And it was intended, because Dougie Slocum actually used special filters that hadn't been used in um, mainstream Hollywood cinema for about 20 or 30 years. He got his start in the 1930s, and it used to be that they would put gauzes over the lens to make the actresses look either younger or more beautiful, diffuse the light. And it was a practice that had more or less disappeared because so many of the cinematographers were dying, and it was sort of a lost art. But he returned to it um, and was wanting to emphasize this kind of historical fantasy and nostalgia, this fictive, the fictive elements and the subjectivity. So while Lillian's scenes with Dashiell Hammett, who is also a figure in this film, have a kind of cold clarity, the shots with Lillian and Julia are very misty and blurred. Um, let's see if I can show you one here, for example, where they are together in a two shot, <coughs> and they're always kept together. Now, at one point in, in this sequence, and I will show you, this dissolves, and you can see the kind of superimposition where it's already moving from one shot to another. There's a very slow dissolve where her image here looks like it has been superimposed a frame within a frame. But there was this kind of overarching concern with these kinds of colonnades and images which are replicated again and again here, um, where she's actually transforming from a student into an anti-fascist resistor. And you see these kinds of illusions um, where memory to a certain extent is connecting her uh, to a kind of resistance historiography which may be fictive, um, and which may be sort of making addresses to certain kinds of um, narratives that don't fit with this particular text. Um, now, the oral history, I think, is particularly interesting. <laughs> Should I, am I going to have to cut it? Okay. Yeah. Well, okay. Now, use. Christina may profess not to care what people think of her work, but products of the culture industries, they have to have a kind of human accountability. Julia's exploration of women's memory and voiceovers is part of a growing historical interest in oral history feminism and the potential for an alternative historiography for women. But writers like Joanne Scott were urging women to study the structures of repression via Foucault rather than doing something on their own and striking out and creating an alternate form of language or meaning um, at odds with the neat structures of conventional historiography. And there were exceptions, of course. And I mentioned Shona Blur uh, Berger Gluck, who is sort of very a very important figure at the same writing at the same time as Kristeva, where she really focuses the, the debate about oral history and women's history. And this is one of the most famous films to actually use a very ambiguous voiceover of Jane Fonda's throughout the film. But I will just say that it emerged in a really uh, a really powerful time. There were lots of films that were coming out about women. There was a lot of investment, I think, in the politicization of women and women's history at this time. And remember, it's also the time for Annie Hall. Three Women, The Goodbye Girl, but it's also the first time in 1977-78 when the United Nations had its first international conference on women's issues. You've had a, the first International Day of Women's Rights. Um, and Jane Fonda, just to comment, said that the old female roles have been done away with, but the financiers of the movies, the men who run the multinational corporations, can't figure out what new stereotypes are <coughs> bankable. Um, so just to conclude, um, this film was sort of lampooned by Molly Haskell, Andrew Saris, and Vincent Canby as, I mean, I'll just quote them, an elusive narrative fragment in desperate need of further amplification, which sounds a lot like some of the criticisms I've heard of Christeva's work and her intellectual dilettantism, if that's not going too far, little realizing that there may potentially be a shadowy, ambiguous historical presence evoked in a rendering of history by alternate means. So a fragmentary history couldn't trumpet great success or backstories of men, spectacle, um, there was something else at work here. And so while I think the content and context of Christe was women's time, work in conversation with postmodern poetics, women's historiographic discourse, and the breakup, really, of the text of the historical film, the real issue for me is seeing a work of film as a self-conscious intervention in a positing of women's history outside of the meta-narrative. Hollywood classicism, women's fiction even, the resistance at work in the signifying process and the rhythms, forms, and excess may be ways toward this idea. Um, in my uh, haste to introduce the panel, I forgot to thank Humberto Garcia and the English department and uh, for the financial support for this whole program. Uh, and some of you uh, are visiting and haven't been to academic conferences. Sometimes there is a time coach. I'm not just being rude, but we can, and, uh, but I do think there'll be a little bit more time for discussion. Thanks, Humberto. The English department has been great. And I should have said started out with that. <laughs>
All right. Thank you, and thank you to Sam, and also to the to the conference organizers. This is this has been a, a wonderful weekend. In light of cinema's rapidly changing cultural status, the philosopher Julia Kristeva urges us to consider the responsibility of the critic to stand at the front line of intellectual and artistic production against the, quote, entertainment culture, show culture, and complacent commentary that dominates contemporary Western culture. Such intellectual and artistic space is crucial, she argues, because it retains and cultivates the possibility of revolt, something we've been talking about all weekend. Um, as Kristeva has argued in the sense and nonsense of revolt, intimate revolt, and elsewhere, the cultivation of re revolt or rebellious ideologies is the only countervailing force against the deadening and disenfranchising effects of consumer culture. Kristeva characterizes the need for revolt in the starkest terms. She writes, the very possibility of culture depends on our response. Importantly, Kristeva's call for revolt is accompanied by her appeal for critics to move away from the interpretation of texts, uh, a surprising turn for a scholar trained as a linguist, and toward an analysis of experience. Quote, I will try to introduce the notion of experience, which includes the pleasure principle, as well as the rebirth of meaning for the other, which can only be understood in view of the experience of revolt. The recasting of theory as experiential rather than textual opens on to another task for the critic, drawing a distinction between the roles of critic and artist. She writes, more than ever, we are faced with the necessary and inevitable osmosis between production and, and interpretation, a process that also implies a redefinition of the distinction between critic on the one hand and the writer or artist on the other. Quote. And as someone who works, um, as a scholar who works primarily with D.W. Winnicott, this is a particularly interesting formulation and, and provocative and also potentially fertile formulation, it seems to me. So today, I'm not going to talk about Winnicott, I promise. Um, today I will examine one aspect in particular of Kristeva's experiential criticism, that is the ludic terms and concepts, nonsense, fantasy, play, and games that for Kristeva provide the groundwork for art and culture's rebellious ethics. In the sense and nonsense of revolt, Kristeva's ludic examples are primarily literary and theoretical, so Aragon and the other surrealists, um, Bart, even Old Sartre, as she calls him. In her follow-up work, Intimate Revolt, she locates the cinema, she kind of zones in on the cinema as, quote, the central place of the contemporary imaginary. In other words, a space for rebellious play. Why does the invisible? Why does the visible? Let me give you this quote. Um, why does the visible lend itself to a primary and fragile synthesis of drives to a more supple, less controlled, riskier representability of instinctual dramas, the games of Eros and Thanatos? Kraseva asks in *Intimate Revolt*, and of course, this is a direct allusion to beyond the pleasure principle, and specifically the fourth dog game that we're, I think we're all familiar with. Take game as a playful, regulated exchange, checkers, for example, she continues, but also as a space of adjustment, the free movement between two elements, the play of a window, for example. Kristeva finds that ludic forms of representation, um, what she calls the psychodrama, are very useful in the clinical situation, when the analyzant cannot draw his psychic or somatic disturbances into the realm of the symbolic. At that point, she would say, he, we invite him to put his drives into play, um, to show them to us. And then she uses two very interesting words. She calls that gesture and image. Indeed, cinema's connections to play are rooted in the basic properties of the medium. The physio-perceptual interplay between images that create the illusion of movement, that's the very kind of basic unit of cinema of the moving image versus a still image, for example, something that we might call gesture and image. The role of repetition, collective viewing practices, and as German philosopher and social theorist Walter Benjamin termed them, its sensory reflexive properties. That is, how moving images engage viewers beyond cognition 
and into the realm of the experience on the one hand and the unconscious on the other. So to understand moving images as ludic, I argue, is also to open up the possibility of ethics with an expanded set of premises. In order to further elucidate Kristeva's rebellious challenge to critics and to the cinema then, I will put her work on revolt into dialogue with interventions by Walter Benjamin and Miriam Bratu Hansen, a film scholar who has undertaken a series of crucial works on Benjamin's concept of cinema's room for play, or Spielraum. Where Benjamin opens up a space for play as counter to the alienating and anesthetizing forces, forces of modernity in the 1930s, when Benjamin was writing, Kristeva will raise the stakes at the turn of the 21st century with her claim that our very happiness and freedom are hanging in the balance. Considering these thinkers together, I contend we can clearly observe cinema's cultural relevance and ethical pledge as they continue to unfold. So I assume that um, almost all of you are familiar with Benjamin's essay, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical well, Technological Reproducibility. As Hansen has pointed out, it, uh, you know, among works measuring the impact of film, mass culture, and modernity, it uh, may have been quoted more than any other single source. We all know this. Um, uh, and in fact, one of the reasons that I've raised the second version of the essay that I'm about to talk about is that um, I think it gives us a sense of its, of its currency, of its actuality. Um, and I find surprising resonances um, between um, between that second version um, and the way that he talks about Spielraum and Chris Davis, um invocations of play. In it, Benjamin describes works of art uh, reproduced technologically, such as film, um, having lost the aura of their origin. Again, most of you know this. That is, the cult value based on their uniqueness and reliquary status. In the second version of the essay, which is not the version that is widely circulated. Most people read the third version of the essay, um, published in 1939. Um, this second version was considered by the author to be the master version. Um, Benjamin makes the connection between cinema and play definitively. He writes, what is lost in the withering of semblance and the decay of aura in works of art is matched by a huge gain in the scope for play, Spielraum. This space for play is widest in film. Miriam Hansen developed this strand of Benjamin's thinking over a course of papers which culminated in what I consider to be a really magisterial, really interesting uh, book, if you don't know it, um, called Cinema and Experience, which, which was published in 2011, the same year she died. Um, and so beginning um, with her first interventions way back in 2004, um, Miriam Hansen took this second version of the Benjamin essay as her subject in order to bring forward this, the importance of Spiel and Spielraum, which remain hidden. They're, they don't, they're totally wiped out of the third and final and best known version of the technological, of the artwork essay. Um, I should also state at the outset that one of the reasons that I am interested in Benjamin beyond the specific concept of room for play is that the artwork essay in all its versions hinges on the question of proximity and distance in relation to perception of artworks. Um, and this would seem to me to be one of the central, if not the central, cinematic questions of the present day. And it also links uh, Benjamin's concerns to um, Kristeva's thinking on cinema and also Kristeva's warnings about so-called bad media objects, right? The anesthetizing effects of most contemporary mass media. So many of the technical, technological transformations with which Benjamin and Kristeva are concerned, each in his or her own time, are grounded in a sense of nearness or distance from the media object, as well as the potential for the viewer or critic to interact or participate creatively in its meaning making. So for Benjamin, the social basis of, of the aura's decay is due in part, quote, to the desire of the present day masses to get closer to things, and their equally passionate concern for overcoming each thing's uniqueness uh, by assimilating it as a reproduction. So one of the reasons that Benjamin's work speaks to us, and I think speaks to Kristeva now as then, is that we're in the midst of a technological change that's exciting and profoundly alienating. Um, not alienating in the Marxist sense, um, but really a much more kind of existential and philosophical one. So cinema's room for play brings us closer to art objects, Benjamin contends. 
um, creating a crucial equilibrium between artist, apparatus, and audience critic. And now I'm deliberately um, conflating the idea of audience and critic. Um, so in terms of audience reception, play is defined by Hansen and Benjamin as an active, creative, participatory, critical state which elicits a certain mode of re receptivity. Now this is to be contrasted with a conception of a much more passive, passively receptive audience member as posited by a film theorist such as Christian Metz, for example. Um, Chris Abel will, will refer to this as a rebellious or critical mode of cinematic reception. So in my reading of Kurseva, every audience member is a potential critic. Um, I'm going to skip the next quote. A fundamentally contestatory, rebellious, critical stance is required, according to Kristeva, giving the predominance of the normalizing and pervertible media over and against cinematic capacity. That is, so the, so the bad media versus the good media examples or cinematic examples that have the capacity, like literature, to reveal, quote, the singularity of experience, which is the basis of her intimate or micro conception of politics and ethics. So to be clear, there are two converging spaces or rooms for play that I'm exploring here. On the one hand, on the, on the side of the audience critic, and on the other, kind of within and around the cinematic object itself. And the two converge, the two come together. Thus, turning back to, to film itself, we ask why and how are technologically reproduced artworks such as cinema rooted in play? Um, in the second version of the artwork essay, Benjamin explains that, quote, the function of film is to train human beings in the apperceptions and reactions needed to deal with a vast apparatus whose role in their lives is expanding almost daily. Now, this theorization rests upon a kind of presumption um, that, that we can rebelliously contest or that we can, or that we can follow. And that is that human being is historically contingent and changeable um, or mutable. Um, and so he talked a lot about this, this pedagogical um, function or this pedagogical um, capacity of cinema, of film in particular, um, this instruction and perception and intuition. Um, and in the case of film, the training of perception takes place in this fundamentally playful, creative act of viewing, um, which interacts with the work of art and film, um, which, uh, and, Benjamin, and Benjamin contends, this is created primarily in the, in the montage, in the editing. So now I'm going to turn sort of from the, the viewer to the, to the critic. How am I doing on time? I mean, to the right. work of art. Mm -hmm. hmm? Five moments? The art of film, Benjamin insists, consists of the interplay between images, which I mentioned earlier. This is part of the, that kind of physio-perceptual process that creates the illusion of the moving image. Um, but the progressive attitude, he calls it progressive, attitude of the masses, audience toward film, he argues, is characterized by an immediate, an immediate intimate fusion of pleasure. The pleasure of seeing and experiencing with, he writes, an attitude of expert appraisal. I think this is, this is resonant, um, though not exactly coterminous with, um, with Kurseva's idea of, the, of the, the kind of the critical viewer. Such fusion, he writes, is an important social index. Benjamin also places great weight, weight on the impermanence of the material cinematic object. He writes, the film is therefore the artwork most capable of improvement, and this capability is linked to its radical renunciation of eternal value. That is, part of film's virtue for Benjamin is that it is mutable, never truly fixed as, say, another art form like sculpture would be. Um, and he's very interested also in the actor's performance in film, something I can't go into now. Um, another point at which the aura is eradicated for him before the apparatus. Finally, Benjamin discusses the way in which the cinematic apparatus intervenes in reality itself. Um, he compares the cinematographer to a surgeon and claims that film provides, quote, the most intensive interpenetration of reality with equipment, end quote. So the equilibrium established between human beings and the apparatus, Benjamin explains, is achieved by revealing hidden details through the close-up and by giving new insight into spatial configurations 
through camera movement, framing, and variations in film sc speed. Excuse me. Also, crucially, the camera provides, quote, a vast and unexpected field of action. This is the spiel run. One of Benjamin's fascinations is what photographic instruments capture that is beyond the capacity of the human eye. Um, he says it can bring out aspects that are accessible only to the lens, but not to the human eye. And from this, he derives, a, a, he de derives or develops something, a, a concept that he calls um, uh, unconscious optics. For Benjamin, the fluidity of the camera is also of another nature. So on the one hand, the lens can see things that the human eye can't see. On the other, um, the fluidity of the camera also is of another nature as compared to the human eye. Um, and it has this kind of othering function for viewers. Other, he writes, above all in the sense that a space informed by human consciousness gives way to a space informed by the unconscious. This is the Oh, this is the optical unconscious for him, which he links intimately, and he uses the word intimately, to the instinctual unconscious of psychoanalysis. Um, so, and I'm going to skip a quote, um, but um, what he's really talking about are the ways that the camera can move, can disrupt, and the montage can also disrupt and isolate, stretch, compress, um, enlarge, reduce, and these he compares, they're outside kind of the normal spectrum of sense impressions, of human sense impressions, of human perception, but also they're things, they're, they're the kinds of um, experiences, bodily and affective and, and perceptual, that are reserved for psychosis, for hallucination, for dreams. Um, and here I think is um, where we can connect up to the kind of the fascinating specular or the thought specular of, of Chris David. And I'll get to that in a second. Um, so if we follow his logic then, um, this optical unconscious becomes accessible to the viewer with, again, certain kinds of films. He also privileges certain kinds of films o over others. The, there's the good cinema and the bad media, uh, cinema and media. Um, and if we follow his logic, it's retraining audience perceptions, but it's a kind of interactive <laughs> model. Benjamin points to Chaplin, to Mickey Mouse, so American slapstick, and Disney films, um, and, um, and others. So, um, and Eisenstein as well. It's interesting to me that both Kristeva and Benjamin have some, some sort of favorite favorites in common. Um, so, like Benjamin, Kristeva also privileges certain exemplars of good cinema, as I talked about before. Her favorites are Eisenstein, Hitchcock, Pasolini, Godard, Rousseau. Um, and like Benjamin, uh, the American slapstick comedy of, Char of Charlie Chaplin. Um, just as with the, the um, art installations of the Venice Biennale that she discusses in, um, uh, in Sense and Nonsense of Revolt, um, Kristeva is drawn to an art in which, quote, the entire body is called on to participate through the senses, this experiential mode I referred to before. But the rebellious work is also art that Kristeva claims provides access to the archaic or time undone. And finally, the final aspect of Kristeva's uh, intervention on cinema that I've mentioned here is that she makes a case for art, um, cinema included, um, in which quote, the equivalence between thought and perception, and particularly their original tie, hallucination, are brought together. This, for her, is the thought or the fascinating specular. Quote, the drive not symbolized, not, whoops, oh, I did, I did, sorry, I thought I put that up for you. Um, the drive not symbolized, not caught in the object, neither in the sign nor in language. So let me read that again because I was distracting you. The drive not symbolized, not caught in the oblique, uh, object, neither in the sign nor in language. So with these qualities in mind, in, and instead of using the examples privileged by Benjamin or Kristeva, to conclude very quickly, um, I want to cite an example, um, show you a clip. Um, <laughs> Do we have time? It's for just so short, I promise. Um, from Terrence Malick's The Tree of Life. Um, now, of course, um, we could spend the rest of the day 
rebelliously reading the Tree of Life through the lens of Kristeva, not least because there are so many ways in which I think, um, you know, we could bring out the, the, you know, we could bring out idealized figures of maternity, the desire to believe, the drive to believe, and, um, and much, much more. But for now, let me just say that I chose this film because of its imbricated streams of thought, fantasy, memory, dreams, and hallucinations. Um, and um, I think that we can and we should view Tree of Life not only in the sense, but also the nonsense of revolt that Kristeva so provocatively and evocatively um, raises. That is, images that contain the galvaudage, the sullying, the idling about, and the uncertainties and randomness implicit in reversal, abjuration, change, detour, um, which repeat and transform. And of course, importantly, that recovering and unfolding that is at the center of revolt for Kristeva, um, that twists and turns and veers off depending on history. And she calls for us. She says it's up to us, the rebellious viewers and crit critics, to complete it. So let me just, um, what I'm going to do is, I'm not going to give you the sound. Um, Um, so she says, um, cinema seizes us here precisely. This is its magic. At the intersection between the sight of a real object and fantasy, the cinematic image makes what is behind identification identifiable. And she says, there's nothing more patently identifiable than the visible. The drive, as I said before, not symbolized not caught in the object, neither the sign nor in language. And for those of you who have seen this film, um, it is ostensibly set up as a kind of, you know, extended framed narrative um, at the center of which is this long flashback. But it, but it is, of course, it's told from the point of view of um, the brother in a family that has experienced um, um, a trauma, and that is the loss of, of, a, of, of another child, a loss of a child. Um, but it is also about um, the relationship between um, nature and grace as, um, as set up, a kind of dichotomy as set up between um, uh, father and mother, the father being nature and the mother being very obviously grace. And this um, kind of very fluid montage, um, which has all kinds of strange sound bridges and, um, and somewhat sentimentalized music and, um, and images um, that are a combination of fantasy, perhaps dream and memory, that take um, the narrator sort of through the early part of his life, um, I think are excellent. Anyway, tree of life. the next End paper of will be about Tree of Life. <laughs> Thank anyway, you. Thank you. pushes Chris Davis' insights farther by insisting on the historical and cultural locativeness of bodies that are produced as other, asking psychoanalysis to address the historical specificity of embodiment. She situates her sensual encounters within a web of relations that cannot be completely removed from power relationships through gender, colonial histories, and other border crossings. At the same time, she never lets these categories or histories uh, fully contain or explain her characters. So challenging notions of the body as unified, teleological, or separate from the mind, the body in trouble every day also resists language. In contrast to most genre films which draw out audience emotions through well-known conventions, Denise's alternative practice refuses her spectators the comforts of encountering the bodies on screen through predetermined generic and cinematic codes. And this means that as viewers, we're open to a higher level of both risk and wonder, as each film is a singular and unforeseen encounter.
So in this paper, I link this spectatorial vulnerability to the themes of risk and exposure that are explored in the film. Um, and Kristeva's writing on objection has been central in feminist approaches to the horror genre. Um, horror as a genre traffics in our anxieties about boundary crossings and the fragile borders of subjectivity. And it's also a genre that specializes in the bodily, both in its display of bodies in fear uh, and in pleasure sometimes, and in the effect that it has on spectators' bodies. And so uh, Trouble Every Day pushes this kind of body genre to its limit, removing the psychological dimensions of horror to examine the pleasure and pain of non-identity that is embodiment. This embrace of bodily non-identity is in tension with the notion of objection as a psychic process that constitutes a body as the integrated site of the self, however much the abject continues to challenge that integration. Um, and in the film, really briefly, two characters are affected by this disease that causes the sexual desire to turn into the urge to mutilate uh, and destroy human flesh. And again, this is a physical disease uh, versus a kind of psychological disorder, which is important. So Shane Brown, who's on the bottom, uh, picture here with his wife, June, who does not know he's infected, uh, is afflicted with the disease in Corbe, who's the woman in the top, uh, who's at a much more advanced stage of illness. Um, and the fourth character in the corner is uh, called Leo Semeno, and he's Corey's husband, um, who was the head of a medical research team in Guyana where the disease originated. So I think significantly the only character who's not white a central character who's not white, Semino, has been banished from the French medical research community for introducing a foreign element that erodes the boundaries between animal and human, body-mind, desire and destruction. That is to say, the disease challenges the notion of the Western subject as rational, civilized, or the self-identical <coughs> subject who abjects the other to assert his own proper boundaries. And this is despite the film's suggestion that it's actually Shane Brown, the white, the grief for knowledge of this American doctor, which is the true source of human contamination. So. Uh, in the film, it's suggested that he disobeyed Semino's prohibition on testing on humans, which is why he's infected in Korea as well. Um, so in this sense, the film explores how strange bodies are produced as the border of identity in both bodily and social spaces. But in part, through infecting the French capital with its own colonial history, the film reveals that, and here I'm adapting a quote from Sarah Ahmed, uh, to apply it to Denis, quote, what is required is not simply a psychoanalytical approach to how identity as such gets established and contested, but how bodies are differentiated through the metonymic association of some bodies and not others with the border that confounds identity. Again, I'm going to kind of just summarize these images because of time, but the film explores attempts at sort of sanitization and cleaning and containment uh, in both environmental and bodily spaces. So uh, a lot of action takes place in this hotel where we see the chambermaids cleaning their bodies and preparing themselves for work. And we also see the hotel hallways, the, kind of the corridor is a repeated shot. So these maids are ceaselessly cleaning this hotel, which of course is in tension with the fact that the disease is harbored within this space. Um, and this bottom scene is a scene where Leo Semino is, is uh, cleaning his wife's body and she's covered in the, the flesh and blood of one of her victims. This is also the kind of repeated scene in the film, which of course further highlights the futility of sanitizing the body from what's foreign within. Um, and in another scene, but I won't uh, do a detailed analysis of because of time, but and I'm sorry it's so dark, some of the images, but um, Shane and June when they're coming, Brown when they're coming to Paris for their honeymoon, we again get this kind of privileged uh, Space, which is the airplane, and the framing and the sound all work to create a sense of the airplane as a kind of contained uh, space, sort of the quintessential controlled environment, but at the same time a space in which bodies are kind of vulnerable to each other and in proximity to each other. And um, the scene that the image that's really dark is these businessmen all sleeping uh, in the intercontinental flight. So again, sort of privilege, but also proximity. Um, and Shane is being afflicted by his desires. He goes to the airplane washroom and suddenly this vision of his wife bathed in uh, blood, uh, looking kind of blissful actually, uh, intrudes into the image, uh, which is very striking because June has a kind of childlike, pristine, and pristine kind of image throughout the film. So here in the confined and regulated space of the airplane, 
desire and otherness intrude into an otherwise mundane scene, graphically exposing the fallacy of the meaning. Um, I'm just going to finish. I don't have to look at her. <laughs> Covered in blood. Uh, the not more, a lot more men die. There's only like one woman that dies in the film. There's a lot of men that die. Um, the non-immunity extends beyond the two disease characters to permeate most of the relations in the film. So victims are lured by desire to their perpetrators. A lab tech feels herself drawn to Shane's plight, and Jude is propelled by the mystery of her husband. So by emphasizing the undeniable desire that flows between bodies, the film highlights the fact that susceptibility to one another is our general condition. And I think she's asking us to consider the body anew and to recognize bodily vulnerability, not so much as a cause for psychosis, but rather as a condition that the Western subject has historically been able to disavow. So while objection may solidify the identity of the subject, Denise's mode of filming suggests that we consider new modes of thinking about our embodied existence that do not equate the non-integrity of the body with psychosis. Um, and I think there's connections to queer theory and critical disability studies here. Really briefly, I'm just going to show you cinematographically how I think she challenges the of the body as coherent, unified, and readable in terms of traditional identity markers, which are all myths that dominant cinema perpetuates. So uh, she tends to shoot the body in fragments rather than as a unified whole. This is from another one of her films, The Intruder. And also uh, her filming of love scenes is really interesting. It's very hard for the gaze to kind of find its footing in her love scenes. Um, so in every case, she's sort of foregrounding the unmasterable singularity of each body at each moment and privileging the exposure of the body over narrative development or psychological exposition. How many for time? Uh, about five okay. more minutes. Five more minutes, we'll okay. Have discussion and do maybe some more clips from uh, Tree of Life and uh, <laughs> Time. So the themes of immunity and risk, of course, gesture beyond the immediate narrative of the film. The disease bears the trace of the French colonial past and its Guyanese origins, which is typical of Denis' interest in France's post-colonial history, or colonial history. Uh, while these identity categories and histories haunt the narrative, the film reveals that the body always operates in excess of their meaning. Rather than otherness originating from a source that the Western body already recognizes as other, that is to say from the former colonies, the disease and trouble challenges the assumption of who the other is. Both Shane and Corre are attractive middle-class white people, and Shane at least possesses a significant amount of mobility. It is in fact their seeming likeness that makes their prey so vulnerable to them. So here it's the European-American body in particular that forms the border of livability, or can never fully be inhabited. So Delmi overlaps with Christeva's concerns in terms of showing that our strangeness to ourselves is our basic condition. But through the medium of, of film, she is better able to register the traces of the histories of encounter that have produced certain bodies as strange bodies. And here I'd refer also to Kelly Oliver's writing on Fanon and the ways in which contract people like Hegel, the Heidegger Sartre, Lacan, the colonized subject experiences a very different form of alienation than the European. So I think Denis occupies a complex middle ground here elliptically reaching towards these particular histories of dehumanization or fragmentation, but also trying to level the playing field through demonstrating the vulnerability and non-identity that is the condition of all, including the European male. So put differently, she asks us to look at the contingency of borders and how the bodies and conditions which they produce as livable or recognizably human shift. And so in this respect, she's offering a modification to Kristeva in Strangers to Ourselves and that she asks us to pay attention to the specificity of strangeness. Uh, rather than attributing a kind of blanket strangeness to all, regardless of the particular histories that have shaped how our bodies are encountered. Okay, and then my conclusion, more or less. Um, so if I had more time, uh, I would talk about Jean-Luc Nancy, uh, who in contrast with Kristeva, uh, argues that the space of non-identity does not have to be a space where meaning collapses but rather is a starting place from which to be meaning anew. So there's not this kind of gap between existence and, and finding meaning or the in itself and for itself in one scene. Uh, so this notion of bodily existence as being meaning and its fragmentation and interrelationality is even more pr pronounced with respect to Denise Ouf as a whole, which foregrounds interruptive contact and opacity as our reality. Trouble every day's challenge to myths of bodily coherence and its preoccupation with spaces of sanitation and contagion works toward exposing the fallacy of bodily immunity both on and off screen. And if I, I'm so briefly touching on Nancy here, but if I had time, I would elaborate more on the ways in which by reading him alongside Kristeva, 
we move closer to a queer reading of the body and one that is sympathetic to perspectives on embodiment and critical disability studies. Um, and because psychoanalytic models, whether read descriptively or prescriptively, tend to operate with a more fixed narrative of our psychic and sex formation and its deviances, they can be limited in terms of opening us up to altogether different ways of thinking about the body and sexuality beyond identity and developmentally based accounts. So in some sense, then, through Janine and Nancy became queer for Stave's important insights, which was where my original title, Queering Objection, came from, but I focused more on locating objection. Um, Denise pushed to think the historical locatedness of bodies as they're constructed uh, raises larger methodological questions, I think, for film scholars, which include, uh, can alternate frameworks allow us to think otherwise about our ontological condition, so in ways that free us from narratives of identity, development, and sexual difference, uh, which perhaps we tacitly commit to if we follow a psychoanalytic model. Will different images and approaches to understanding those images open up different futures for cinema and its spectators? So returning to the themes of risk, exposure, and vulnerability as they apply to the spectator, who, as I argued, is rendered more vulnerable to the image when a film lacks the cinematic conventions and generic codes through which the viewer is normally protected from an encounter with what is unmasterable and less controlled, I would argue that paralleling the themes of trouble, dominant Western cinema has catered to a spectator who can abject the not-self from the self and believe in their own visual mastery and ability to know that which is placed before them. Thus, through her themes and formal strategies in challenging the Western body on screen, Denny also challenges the spectatorial body off screen. Thanks, Benina. Um, and in this paper, I'm particularly interested in her chapter on Romeo and Juliet that appears in Tales of Love. And I'm offering an aesthetic reading of love and death in the film adaptations of that play. So to begin, the most famous tomb in all of Shakespeare's works belongs to his lovers from Verona, Romeo and Juliet. The Capulet tomb marks the conclusion of the play, a deadly destination for which the play swiftly departs and represents the consummation in all senses of Romeo and Juliet's love. The inescapable destination of the two powerfully focuses our attention on the couple's claustrophobic isolation and triumph. It has long been observed that death and love are inseparable in the play. From the opening description of the chorus, which announces, quote, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life and declares Romeo and Juliet's love as death